I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 14. Luke 14 is our text. And uh, if you don't have a Bible and, uh, or a Bible app on your device, then that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn it to page 1038, and you will find Luke 14, 1038. You'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one. If you're uh, joining us online then, uh, and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then let us know. We'll get you a Bible. And uh, if you're at our Parker campus and you need a Bible right now, there's a table in the back. You can just go back there and grab it and use it. Turn to page 1038 and take it home with you as well because we want everyone to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, if you want to know the other way I think that God will change your life if you give him a chance is if you'll get in a life group. If, uh, if you're not in a life group, we want you to be in a life group. Life change happens in the context of relationships with other people who love Jesus and are following him. And, and I'm just telling you that if, uh, if you're looking at your, your spiritual life and you're going, I'm stuck, I need to grow, I need, I need something, and you're not in a life group, you might want to try a life group. If that's the way you are and you're in a life group, you might want to try another one. I don't know. Uh, but uh, look, you might want to join a life group, and, and here's why. Proverbs says, the one who walks with the wise becomes wise, wise and the companion of fools suffers harm. Uh, surround yourself with people who love Jesus and are trying to follow him. Do it together, and you'll be amazed at what God does in your life. So you want to stop by a table and find a life group, sign up for a life group. Uh, if you can't find one that you like, go complain to Pastor Pete. He'll be excited that you, uh, you come to him and say, I want a life group. Some of you are sitting here go, you know, I used to lead a life group. I probably should do that. You need to go see Pastor Pete as well and just apologize and repent and sign up. So... Uh, uh, look, we got people that need life groups. We got uh, leaders who need life groups. It's, uh, it's a perfect match. So speaking of uh, life, who wants to be successful in life? Anybody? Okay. Most of you raised your hands. If you didn't raise your hand, uh, who aspires to be a failure? Okay. Well, you know, if that's your goal, you, congratulations. You'll probably achieve it. Um, look, I want to be successful in life. And one of those reasons is because as a young man, as a teenager, uh, can I just tell you, I was a complete and total loser. It's true. Some of you are like, some of you are like, yeah, no way. I can't see it. And I'm just telling you, uh, it, it's true. You're, you're looking at me and you see a successful pastor. I've been here at Calvary for 30 years, all that kind of stuff. I get that. Uh, some of you, of course, are like, no, I can totally see it. <laughs> you don't have to convince me. It's written all over your face. So, uh, but if, look, if you're having trouble imagining that, uh, let me just tell you the setting. I, I grew up moving all the time, 15 houses, first 18 years of my life. So I was always the new kid, and I wanted desperately to fit in, and so I tried way too hard. Some of you know the pain. And, uh, and not only that, but uh, as I like to put it, I was raised by wolves. Uh, look, I'm the only extrovert in a family of six people. Everybody else was an introvert. So I was socially eager and socially awkward all at the same time. And my mouth uh, was writing checks that my abilities couldn't cash. And so I just, look, I was, I was socially clueless. That's why Merelda, my wife of 38 years, turned me down for high school homecoming dance her freshman year, her sophomore year, and her junior year. <laughs> because I was a loser. I, I, look, that, that's just a, so. If you're if you're sitting here and you're in high school and you're not really excited about what you see in the mirror, I'm just telling you, God can change lives. See that that all began to change in June of 1978 when I was at a youth camp, and uh, I was tired of being who I was, and so I surrendered to God. I asked God to take control of my life. I was like, well, I, I, I'm terrible at this, so why don't you have a shot? You say you're good at leading, and and that began a life change because. Here, here's what happened. I began reading and applying God's Word, and God changed my life. So I'm passionate about that, that tr core value we have of relatable truth. And, and I discovered the Jesus strategy for success. Okay, the Jesus strategy for success, because he'll tell you how to do your life. And his strategy for success is simply this. If you desire success, practice humility. If you desire success, 
Practice humility. Luke 14, beginning in verse 7, Jesus is at the home of a Pharisee, was surrounded by Pharisees. These are all religious elite. And this is what he says to them at this home. He says, now he told a parable, Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, as I mentioned, Jesus is at a dinner party with religious leaders, and he sees their pride being acted out all around him. He sees them jockeying for position, for honor. Now, this was an incredibly honor-based culture. We're not really uh, an honor-based culture in that same res regard. Some of you were raised that way, right? You know, with your families and everything, you had to show respect to your elders and everything. Well, they were, the whole culture was honor-based. So they took this really seriously. And Jesus confronts their pride with a teaching on humility. Teaching on humility. Uh, now, humility is often used and misunderstood and misrepresented concept. It, ju it just gets a bad rap in a lot of ways. So I'd like to start off by clearing up some, con some confusions that I have heard people have with humility. So let me be really clear. Humility is not seeing yourself as worthless or doormat or deserving abuse. Okay, that is not biblical humility. Jesus came into this world full of grace and truth. And so our attitudes should be formed by the Word of God and by His mercy in our lives. So I want you to hear some things from the Word of God. Genesis 1 says that all of us were made in the image of God. Okay, the psalmist in Psalm 139 says, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that fully. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, God's truth declares that you are wonderfully made. Yeah, you. You were, you were wonderfully made. In fact, Jesus calls you his masterpiece. That's what workmanship is all about. You're a masterpiece. You're, you're beautiful to him. And, and also, you are qualified to accomplish great things for his kingdom. I love that end of, of Ephesians 2.10. Not only are you God's workmanship, but you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. I mean, that, that's just an amazing concept. So this is who you are. And on top of all of those truths, guess what? Jesus died to redeem you from hell. Jesus died to bring you into relationship with him so that you could be a son and daughter of God. You are loved and valued by God. Let me say that again. You are loved and valued by God. It's easy words to say. It's really hard to hear. So why don't you look at the person next to you, that you're sitting next to you and go, you are loved and valued by God. Some of you need to practice saying that without laughing. <laughs> See, what that means is, look, all of us are priceless, not worthless. And as a valuable creation of God, uh, look, I'm just going to tell you, you should have healthy boundaries. Let me say that again. As a valuable creation of God, you should have healthy boundaries, which means it is okay for you to say no. Okay, it's okay to say no. You don't have to do everything everyone else asks you to do. And by the way, you never ever deserve to be abused by anyone. 
No one deserves to be abused by anyone. By the way, if you are suffering an abusive relationship, there's help for you. I mean, part of the, one of the ministries Calvary supports is called Faith and Grace. Uh, they're a domestic violence shelter. So if you're in trouble, we can help you. See us after the service. But, but there's a lot of people who think humility is believing that you're worthless and allowing people to trample you and use you and abuse you. That is not biblical humility. Please see yourself for who you are. You are God's beautiful creation. You are valued by God. You are loved by Jesus. And in fact, he gave his life to save you, to make you his own. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then I'm assuming that you not only want to be successful, but that you want to be successful Jesus' way. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, look, we want you to embrace the love of Jesus. Everything I said is true for you. We want you to say yes to Jesus. We want you to surrender to Jesus. We want you to trust him to be your savior and confess him as Lord. Okay, that, that's our desire for you. But here's the crazy thing. If you do success his way, it's gonna work. Even if you don't believe in Jesus. So uh, if you want success, practice humility. Now, since we're talking about humility, what are the traits of humility? Because, again, we talked about what it is not, but what does it look like? Because humility is one of those nebulous things. It's hard to talk about because if you talk about it uh, and, and point it out, then, you know, it's, oh, we're not being humble anymore, are we? Right? And, and, and so it, it's kind of one of those awkward things. So what I want to do is I'm going to describe it. I, I want to I kind of tell you the characteristics, uh, again, biblically, of what it looks like. So... We know what humility isn't, so what does it look like? And by the way, Scripture repeatedly, I mean like over and over and over again, talks about humility. Uh, in Proverbs it says, humility comes before honor. Jesus uh, demonstrated humility when he got down at the Last Supper and washed the feet of his disciples, including the betrayer, and said, in, in the same way that I have done this to you, you do it to one another. In the same way that I've served you, you serve one another. The, the students are not above the teacher. So we see humility in Jesus' example. And then Scripture repeats at least six times verse 11. I'm going to read it again. It's, a, it's kind of a linchpin to this whole teaching. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, you got that? By the way, Scripture repeats that. When you see stuff that Scripture repeats, you should pay attention. Okay, if you're reading the Bible, which I encourage you to do, notice when it says something more than once. And if it repeats it like five, ten times, then really pay attention to it. Okay? By the way, it tells us to rejoice like 300 times in Scripture, so uh, we should figure that out. So anyway, today, I want you to be successful. You guys have already said you want to be successful Jesus wants you to be successful too. So here's three biblical traits of humility. First of all, humility means that you embrace a servant identity. You embrace a servant identity. If you claim to follow Jesus, I want you to understand that this is your core biblical identity. Servant. Say, hey, I am a servant. That's what I am. I, that's who I am. That's what I do. So get it this way. If you're a follower of Jesus, that means that you confess Jesus as Lord. It's not a trick question, okay? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So if you confess Jesus as Lord, that means that we are his servants. Yeah, see, Lord means master. Master means that he actually not just bosses us, but owns us, literally. And so we are his servants. It's a relationship, submissive relationship, which is why I said I surrendered, why I invite you to surrender. And so Jesus said, hey, if you want to be great, you should be the servant of, you guys know the answer? Everyone. Be the servant of, any, if you want to be great, be the servant of everyone. <laughs> now, Here's the thing, and this is the disconnect that we have. We want to be successful, but we want to be successful our way, not Jesus' way. Because Jesus' way is annoying. Right? 
Now, his way works, our way doesn't. His way works, our way leaves us empty at the end of life going, oh, I blew it, I was heading for the wrong destination and I got there. Okay, so Jesus' way works. And Jesus said, look, if you want to be great, be the servant of everyone. And he goes on to say, for the Son of Man, God in the flesh, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said, look, I didn't come here for you guys to serve me, and I happen to be the creator and redeemer of the world. I came to serve. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who happened to just write 13 New Testament letters, it's kind of a big deal, identified himself as a servant of Jesus Christ time and time and time again. Okay? A servant. That's that, his primary identity. The way that he communicated about himself to other people was, I'm serving Jesus. He wasn't the only apostle to do that. The apostles James, Peter, Jude, and John also identified themselves as servants. So what does a servant do? <laughs> they serve, yeah. Well, you know, some of you are struggling with these questions. I thought I'd throw a softball out there. Let you guys just kind of like, I can get, I got this answer. Now, and here's the thing, and I, and I want you to hear this. I, like, I love the fact that we've got so many people who volunteer and serve around Calvary. It is amazing. It is wonderful. I love the way we go out in the community and we serve and do the projects and stuff like that. But when Jesus talks about serving, when the Bible talks about serving, it's not talking about, you know, just volunteering in the church and community. It, he's talking about an attitude about how we see life. It is about a disposition from the time you wake up in the morning until you lay your head down at night. It's our identity. It's who we are. Uh, being a servant means that you ask in every relationship, every encounter that you have with people, how can I help them? How can I bless them? How can I help them live? How can I help them grow? How can I help them survive? How can I help them thrive in who they are and who God created them to be? It means that you don't see people as obstacles to what you want to get out of life. You see them as opportunities to bless along the way. It also means that you see people as equally valuable as yourself and your loved ones. Uh, most of us have a disposition where we look at life and we go, here's who's really important. You know, maybe that's your spouse, maybe that's your kids, your grandkids. All oh, the grandkids would be up here, right? Uh, and, and then you've got your friends, and they're, they're, they're important. And, and then you've got, you know, these other people that are kind of nebulous, and then you've got people who are really unimportant. And, and we kind of categorize that way. We don't think about it. That's why I'm talking about this has got to be an attitude that permeates everything that we do because we don't just want to, to think that we go on through life normal. We've we got to see people differently, and when we see them as opportunities rather than obstacles, we stop thinking about how they can bless us, and we start thinking about how we can bless them. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, or, Verses 3 and 4. Amazing verses. It should be your life verse, or at least one of them. The Apostle Paul says, Do nothing, absolutely nothing, from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourself. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. What an amazing challenge. Do nothing selfishly. Now, he's saying that, he, I understand, he's not saying that other people are more important than you. He's just saying, treat them as if they were more important than you. So it leads us to ask some, some questions about ourselves. You know, when, when we come to worship, do we come to receive or to give? Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Are, are we here, you know, saying, okay, God, fill me up? Or are we here going, okay, God, how can I bless you? Is your default attitude, how do I bless others, or is it how can I get blessed? Now, now look, you go out to eat. Say you go out to eat after the service. And, and you go there, and there's people who are going to take care of you. They're, they're called servers, waiters, waitresses, whatever you want to call them. And, and here's the thing. They're going to bless you because they're going to take your order and bring your food, and they're going to hopefully bring you lots of free refills and stuff like that. Uh, and, 
and, and you know, they're serving you, and that's a great thing because that's their job. But here's the thing. When you sit down, do you look at them as, oh, yeah, they're here to bless me? Or do you look at them and say, how can I bless them? See, servant attitude. Embrace that identity so that everything you do is about how can I bless, not just how can I be blessed. See, the selfish thing says, how can I be blessed? But, but serving says, how can I bless others? So this is really deciding that every single day in every encounter with people, you're gonna practice the self-denial that Jesus said, if you're gonna follow me, you gotta deny yourself, take up your cross, and come follow me. So see every single person as created and loved by God and treat them that way. So humility is embracing a servant identity, first and foremost. And then humility means that you trust God to promote you. Trust God to promote you. Now, this is illustrated by Jesus at the wedding feast, and, and I, I love that. He says, look, don't claim the honor. You know, when you walk into the room and, and you see the seating, and apparently, again, I mean, it was an honor culture, so, you know, they had the most important to the least important. Don't go for the most important seat and then have somebody else more important than you show up and they go, hey, you have to move. Now there's nothing left but the back row. I know a lot of us like the back row, but, you know, again, we're not an honor-based culture. So he says, don't do that. Instead, when you... When you walk in, you take the seat of least honor so that people can come and say, no, 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 you have to move forward. You have to move up. And they put you in a place of honor. So Jesus challenged them and us to refuse to seek honor or privilege or promotion. By the way, Proverbs 27, 2 says, let another praise you and not your own mouth. Don't be your own PR guy. Don't be your own promoter. See, let's be honest. This whole idea of trusting God to promote you challenges our instincts. Because we are naturally self-promoters. We are our offspring's advocates, right? We want to do well. We want our kids to do well. We want our grandkids to do well. We want to be first in line. We want to get the best. We want to enjoy. I mean, come on. If we can get that pass that allows us to get to the front of the line at Disney, we are taking it. Right? And Jesus says, that's pride. Choose humility. I mean, pride, which we're, we're all guilty of it, so let's just go ahead and confess it. Pride says, I'm important. Do you know who I am? Pride says, I deserve the seat of honor. I earned it. Humility just says, hey, you know what? I'm happy to be here. I will take the lowly seat. Hey, how can I bless others? By the way, he's talking about a wedding. And, and, and I love that because the wedding is all about who? Yeah, the bride and groom. And these people aren't the bride and groom. They're the guests, and they're vying for honor at the wedding. It's like, hey, morons, just bless the bride and groom. They're the people that are supposed to be honored, right? Just you, just sit wherever and, and let them get the, get the honor. So let me just confess, because we're being honest. For years, as Calvary was growing and, and uh, becoming uh, the church that it is today, I was frustrated because we're part of the Arizona Southern Baptist Convention and all the big shots down in Phoenix just didn't care about what was going on out here in Lake Havasu. I mean, we're on the fringes of the state. And, and so, you know, and I was frustrated. It's like, well, they don't, they're, not, they're not recognizing us. They're not giving us honor. They're not doing all this kind of stuff. And finally, God just rebuked me. Can I just be honest? God just met me and said, I'd probably preach in, you know, a sermon like this. And he's like, hey, uh, you're asking for honor. Why don't you just rejoice where you are and let God take care of it? And I did. I repented. And I just said, God, thanks for uh, what you're doing in Lake Havasu. Thanks for what, you know, you've opened the door for us. And, and I was satisfied with, with just them ignoring us. And uh, now... I get invited to speak more than I want to. Uh, I get asked to be a consultant to help other churches. Calvary is recognized and honored as the leading Southern Baptist church in the state of Arizona and beyond. And, and I'm just telling you that humility is trusting God to promote us. Humility is trusting God to lift you up or exalt you. It's hard to do, but that's what humility looks like. 
Humility is trusting God to promote you. And then the third trait of humility is gratitude and celebration fill your life. Gratitude and celebration fill your life. See, I think one of the most telling traits of humility is gratitude. Gratitude means you're grateful for God's blessings because you know that you're blessed more than you deserve. Gratitude means that you're grateful for mercy because this is the coolest deal ever. I deserve hell, but I get to go to heaven because of Christ. I mean, <laughs> how, how can you have a bad day when you stop and think about that? Jesus suffered for me so that I get to go to heaven even though I earn the right to go to hell because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, gratitude means that you're grateful to be included in God's family and God's kingdom. I mean, we've talked about that. We're joint heirs with Jesus. Everything he gets, which by the way is everything, we share in. Not only that, but we have the promise of heaven. I already mentioned that, which means that it only gets better. Whatever you're going through, it only gets better. And see, when gratitude dominates your life, it is easy to celebrate. And when I talk about celebrate, I mean you celebrate for and with others. Pride leads us to jealousy and envy. Think about this. Pride says, hey, why did they get recognition? I deserve it more. Can I just confess, I have to repent of pride every single day. I would go to meetings in Phoenix. I already mentioned this uh, about letting God promote you. And I would just sit there and I would struggle because I'm like, why are they getting recognition? Why are they being held up as an example? It should be Calvary. And, and that's pride, and there's not any gratitude and celebration in that. Why did they get recognition? I deserve it more. Why did they get promoted? I do better at the job. Why did they get the new job? I, you know, I wanted it. Why did they get healed when I prayed? Why did God give them talent and not me? The Apostle Paul challenged the church to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who who weep. That's what the body of Christ does. Okay? That's the standard. When we're being humble, we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. Um, pride and envy rejoices when people weep and weeps when people rejoice. You've been there and seen it. Somebody is all excited and they're celebrating and, and, and somebody who's supposed to be a friend or an acquaintance or a family member is back there kind of bad-mouthing the whole situation. You know, they're, they're just, they're, they can't be happy about that celebration. And, and when somebody has a tragedy, they're almost like delighted because they get to, you know, kind of talk about it and, and everything. It, it's, it's sad. See, humility grieves with those who suffer loss and celebrates with those who win. Humility can, can actually say, hey, good for you. I'm happy that God blessed you. Let's celebrate your success and your victory. So that's what humility looks like. You identify as a servant. You trust God to promote you. And gratitude and celebration fill your life. That's the Jesus path to success. Which path are you taking in your life? Remember, Jesus said, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Will you pray with me? Father, we're humbled that you know us. In fact, you know how many hairs we have on our head. You know every single one of our days before one of them came to be. You know our thoughts. You know everything we've done in rebellion, in defiance. You know every sin that we've engaged in, and yet you still love us. In fact, you were willing to sacrifice your one and only son to redeem us from hell, to give us hope, to give us a future. And, and that, is, that is too wonderful almost for us to know. Your goodness 
amazes us and thrills us. But God, we just acknowledge that so often we get distracted and we try to live life our way and we try to be successful our way. And God, it leads us to trouble. It leads us to sorrow. It leads us to failure. It leads us to emptiness. So tonight, we just simply want to repent. And we want to give ourselves to you again. We want to surrender and we want to take up the Jesus path to success. Lord, we want to be people who practice humility. So right now, we invite your spirit to to convict us of our sin, to challenge us to change and to give us the courage to follow you differently starting right now. Because your goodness won't leave us. Because we are blessed beyond what we deserve. And because the best is still yet to come. We pray this.